Well, I was having I was having this. Okay, we've got 1.30, so why don't we get started? Good afternoon, Research Methods. Oh, we can do better than that. Good afternoon, Research Methods. There it is. Okay, all right. Welcome to week number eight. Hope you had a great weekend. Hope that you had the chance to enjoy the inauguration events. We don't inaugurate a president every week around here. It's been about 13 or 15 years or something like that. So it's the first time that I've been at an inauguration. I hope that you enjoyed the events. Uh, and it was really quite a nice weekend for it. So, even better news than that, here we are in week number eight, and we've got a computer quiz coming up on Wednesday. Let's give it up for the computer quiz. Yay! <laughs> okay. All right, so we've already had one of these computer quizzes, so you're already practiced in those, but I thought I'd make available to you on PowerPoint and also on the S drive this typical preparation slide that we have. So how many points is it worth? It's worth 50, just like the last one was, and that's 50 out of 800. And we've already had our conversation about how to keep this into perspective. Right? This course is only worth 1 32nd of your entire GPA, and this is only a very small fraction of that 1 32nd. Okay, so you'll have the entire period for this. Um, you will not need to bring a formula sheet, but I'll provide one to you. And this is something that you've seen before. It will clear out your assignment inbox and so forth. What I thought would be most helpful to you is for me to remind you about how to prepare for this, some SPSS skills. The chi-square test of independence is something that we've done before. We did that on Wednesday of last week, and we'll uh, return to that idea uh, today as we're doing chi-square inside of Excel. Well, we've already done, or we will be doing today, a goodness of fit inside of SPSS. Um, independent samples t-tests in uh, SPSS. We may or may not have that on the test. Depends on how far we get tomorrow. So for the moment, that's still on the radar, but we'll see. I don't want to push you too hard if it turns out that we're not really covering that adequately in test uh, uh, during, during the day tomorrow, then it wouldn't be fair to have that on Wednesday's quiz. Excel bits. We've already done z-scores and using the norms inv and the, the norms dist functions. You might want to practice with those. The chi-square test of independence and goodness of fit also in Excel. And just a reminder of when this room is open so that you can come in and take advantage of the SPSS software. Okay. Okay, so I'll go over that again tomorrow, and we'll see how far we get into our conversation today. Um, what we were doing for today was talking about <coughs> experimental designs, and we talked a little bit about um, t-tests and so forth, and how we prepare for um, drawing causal inferences and all of that. But we also left off in the middle of a computation last Wednesday. So what I thought we'd do is just begin to get back out there, and hopefully you can join me out in Excel, if you'll all dial out, <coughs> excuse my voice, to the chi-square problem that we were on. And remember that there's a chi-square test for the goodness of fit, and there's a chi-square test of independence, and we were on the chi-square test of independence. We'll give you all a moment to get out there. I'll turn down the front portion at least, and maybe the backlight also, so we get a little better contrast. What do we think? Is this better or is that better? All the way dark or partially dark? They're the same? Okay, I guess, I guess they're about the same. Okay, so again, that was out on the Matthews N file, and that's like 203. And then within the practice files, we have the chi-square test of independence practice set. How many people found that? Okay. And if you have found it, can you make sure that your neighbor has found it? Also, we'll give, uh, make sure that everybody is on there. While we're waiting for a few people to find that file out on the S drive, let's just have a couple of uh, warm-up questions that remind us about the chi-square. So I wonder if somebody can tell us, when do we use a chi-square test? When do we use, uh, under what conditions do we use a chi-square test? Can anybody help us with that? Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Okay. Okay, very good. We want to see if two variables are correlated. We might say if there's an association between the variables. Okay. I wonder if I can ask you to think about this in a uh, slightly more involved way. Can you compare and contrast the chi-square test with maybe the Pearson or the Spearman? How are they similar? How are they different? Can anybody help us out with that? So we're doing a chi-square, and Sasha's correctly told us that it's a matter of looking for an association. At least that's the case for the chi-square test of independence. How might we can compare or contrast this. We'll go with Natalie and then with Jenna. Yeah. Um, so chi-square tests are more categorical data. Okay, for categorical data. Right. Um, and then Pearson uh, incorporates also ordinal data. Okay. 
Pearson, that's, that's a really good start. So certainly chi-square is going to be for categorical data. And by the way, I hope you'll make a note of this. You actually can use a chi-square on ordinal data if you treat the ordinal data as if those are categories. But generally speaking, no, uh, and we hadn't talked about that before, so you're right on track with chi-square is for categorical or nominal data. Okay? And then Pearson is also about correlation. Natalie's right about that. Uh, Jenna, did you want to add anything to that? Okay. Uh, how would a Pearson then be different if, if chi-square is about associations and Pearson's about associations, uh, how are those different from each other? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Chi-square isn't based on a mean. Okay, the chi-square is not based on a mean, okay? So we, and what do we have? We have a fancy word for those tests that are based on means versus those that are not based on means. Anybody want to help us with that? Go ahead, Jenna. Okay, and which one's which non-parametric and parametric? That's right, yep, okay, and the parametric is based on, I mean, Giselle, is that what you were going to add? Yeah. Okay, really good. Can somebody still help us out with this distinction? So it looks like we have uh, a test called the chi-square test of independence that helps us find associations. Okay, we also had uh, associations, uh, we can call those correlations as well. When we did the Pearson, how, how is the Pearson different from the chi-square? We've actually already gotten a hint about that, but I want to make it really clear. How is the Pearson different from the chi-square? So we know that one's based on the means, okay? That, that, will, that will be one idea. What does that tell us? If something is based on means, what does that imply? It's based on the means. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Okay, I, uh, chi-square is going to look at the independence between two variables. That, that's true. Another way of saying that is we're asking really are they correlated or not, right? But you can kind of say that, well, the Pearson's about correlation also. So the earlier statement that we made about chi-square was that it was looking at nominal variables or categorical variables. Okay, what can we say about the Pearson? What kinds of variables would we be looking at for the Pearson? Wouldn't be nominal. What else could it, if, if it's going to be based on a mean, then what kinds of variables would we have to have? Okay, it would have to be something higher than ordinal. It would have to be something like ratio or scale variables. Okay, and then there was one other kind of correlational test. Pearson was one. Chi-square is another. Anybody remember the other? Just yell it out if you know it. Spearman. Okay, and how is Spearman different from Pearson? It was called the Spearman's row. How is that different? Oh, these would be great questions for Wednesday. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Natalie. Um, yeah, Perfect, okay. So on this very, very refined kind of a scale where we might have uh, interval ratio data, we would use the Pearson statistic. And that would give us the greatest precision, and that would be based on a mean. If we're going to be using an ordinal scale, we can use the Spearman's row, and that will not be based on a mean, so that's non-parametric. And if we can only use categorical classifications on our variables, we're going to be using a chi-square. What they all have in common is they're all looking for associations. Okay? Who's following that? I think we'll have that. All right, looks like we're there. Any, anybody not following that? Okay, I think that works for us. All right, so we were doing, before we got interrupted on Wednesday, we were looking at an association between two categorical variables. And we were looking specifically at these politically oriented variables. One was whether individuals were classified as either Republican or Democrat. And then we had their attitudes, and a lot of psychology uh, is a measure of attitudinal, um, uh, attitudes in general. We can say that some folks had an attitude toward affirmative action that was relatively positive, others that were less positive. The expressions that we used there were mend it, don't end it, or end it, don't mend it. And we had 100 people in this hypothetical sample, and our row marginals and column marginals uh, tell us about the breakdown there. Can somebody just remind us what we mean by the marginals? Just yell it out if you know it. What do the marginals tell us? The totals, right? Okay, they're nothing more. It's a fancy word for totals, okay? So we had 10 Republicans who said, bend it, don't end it, and 30 Democrats, a total of 40 Republicans, 60 uh, who were saying, end it, don't mend it, okay, overall. And we were about to uh, get our expected values. So what we might do is go to a sheet like this and see if we can get our expected values. We've, we have a two by two, so we're going to need a total of four expected values, and we have two of them so far. I'll turn them red just to highlight it and make sure it's really clear to everybody um, what we've got there. I might even be able to bump this up a notch. Can I highlight the whole bit? And make this a little bit bigger for the folks in the back. Is that better? 
Yep, all right. All right, so we had some expected values. Um, can somebody help me in getting an expected value here for end it, don't mend it, and Republican? Who can help me with those steps? Call them out if you know them. Okay, thanks. Katie? Um, row times uh, column uh -huh. divided by, uh, divided by... What's it divided by? That's a row, row marginal times column marginal divided by... The total, right? Okay, and that's coming right from here on this handout, which we had from the other day. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to say that I need to get the expected value for this particular cell, and we'll see what we come up with. If we do the formula that Katie suggested, so we're going to do equals, and I'll put it in parenthesis, but I wouldn't have to, 60 times the row marginal of 30, or sorry, the column marginal of 30, divided by the grand total, which was 100. Okay. So that's where <clears throat> those numbers are coming from. I'll let you hit the enter key and you tell me what expected value you get. 18? How many people can corroborate that number? 18? Has anybody lost on that? Okay, so we have an observed value of 20 and expected value of 18. I'll turn that red just so we can make sure that we know which is observed, which is expected. I'll copy down this word expected. Okay, let's do that one more time for our remaining cell. We have a 2 by 2, so we have four cells. And one more time, it equals the row marginal for that particular cell times the corresponding column marginal, okay, divided by the grand total. And I'll let you tell me what number you come up with in that case. You yell it out once you get it. Okay, some people are yelling out 42. How many people can corroborate that number? 42? How many people are not getting 42? It's okay if you're not. You're not getting 42. Okay, all right, let's, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to hit this, and I get 42, and we'll just make sure. Thank you for saying so. Okay? What we're doing here is getting the expected values, as we talked about before. In our chi-square, we're always going to compare the observed values to the expected values. We have to derive the expected values. And the, the way that we do that, Kip, is by looking at this formula. I don't know if you have that sheet in front of you from the other day or not. And down toward the bottom, it says expected frequency of a cell. And then it gives us a numerator and denominator. The numerator is a row marginal times its column marginal. Okay, that's going to be our numerator divided by the, the grand total that we have. Okay? And that's always the generic formula. We just have to slide in the appropriate column and row marginals depending on where the cell is positioned. Does that help? Okay. How many people are okay with that now? All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Our next step then is to try to get this other quantity that we see, which is up here on the top. We have to get this, essentially a squared deviate. We've done squared deviates before. Here, the squared deviate is all about the difference between the observed and the expected value. We're going to square that difference and then divide it by, our fancy word there is normalize it by the expected value. So I just want to make sure how many people can find that formula on the top of this. You're seeing that. That is that parenthetical phrase O minus E quantity squared uh, over E. And there's some RCs in there just to tell us that we have to do that for every row and every column is what the RC stands for. Okay? All right. So why don't we go ahead and see if we can do that here. I'll put this indication that we're doing the computation of O minus E. That quantity gets squared. So we can think of that as our squared deviate. We've done squared deviates before, even when we did the sums of square. Okay? And that whole thing gets divided by the expected value. Okay? So that's the formula that we're going to be working with. And we have to do that once for each cell in our 2x2 two two design. We have a 2x2 two because two we have two levels of political affiliation and two levels of attitude. Okay? All right, so let's see if we can get that going. We're going to see if we can build that. I'm now in, I'm in cell D20. You don't have to be exactly there, but uh, that would be a cell that works for us. Okay? And so let's see if we can build that. We'll say equals. We'll open a left paren. And let's do Republican, mend it, don't end it first. That's the observed value and the expected value. We have to take those two in. So we'll click on the 10 as the observed value minus the expected value, and that's clicking on the 12. We put a parenthesis around that, and we take that difference, and we square that difference. Can we all show us how we do the squaring by gesticulation? What sign do we use? There we go. <laughs> okay. Yep, we're putting that on our, our heads, and we go like that. Now we have a squared deviation, but there's one more thing before we hit the go button. According to our formula, we have to take that and divide it by the expected value for that cell, and that's going to be that 12 one more time. So I'm going to leave my formula up there. You can hit go, and you can yell out 
what kind of a value you get. In fact, I would, please do get that. What value do you get? Okay, sounds like we're getting convergence on point three three three. How many people have that? Okay, and I'm going to see if I get that number. If I had a typo, I get a point three three also. So that's our squared and normalized deviate for that particular cell. Okay, anybody lost on that? Okay. Okay, that's that's finding. Uh, we're going to use that to get to the chi square. Okay, okay. but we have to find. The, uh, that's one of the steps along the way, right? We might call that the squared deviation for that particular cell, and we have four cells because it's a two by two. Okay? Very good question. Let's do it again for the neighboring cell. Okay, let's get in the habit of building this. This will be a really good question for Wednesday's quiz, something like this. So you want to get some practice in doing these square deviates. And again, the idea is observed minus expected. So I'm clicking on the 30 minus the 28. I close off that quantity. After having found that difference, I want to square it. And before I hit the go button, I do need to normalize it by the expected value according to our formula. I'll let you do that and yell out what number you get. 0.14, let's see if that's what I got. 0.14, okay. So we're going to do that now twice more. We're going to do that for this third and fourth cells. And then we'll have all of the square deviates that we need. One more time. I'll go a little faster now. We'll click on the observed minus the expected. That quantity gets squared. We divide that by the expected value from that same cell. And when I do that, I get a 0 0.22. We'll do it one more time, and you can go at your own pace now. Equals, open a left paren, observed, minus expected. That quantity gets squared. We divide that, as always, or normalize it by the expected value for that cell and I come up with a 0.09. I'll pause there until we've all caught up. But if you can corroborate those numbers, would you please raise your hand so I can see where people are, okay? All right, so what we've basically done is asked, to what extent does the empirical observation match what's been predicted by the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis gives us those expected values, okay? That's it. That computation that we did a moment ago was a way of deriving what the null hypothesis would, would expect. And so now we have all these squared deviates. What we're going to do now is come up with a chi-square statistic. So if you'll join me by putting in, in the word chi-square. And all we have to do according to this formula is sum across all of those rows and columns. And we have two rows, two columns here. Okay, so we'll say that this is equal to a sum. And now I'll highlight over these four squared deviates. And I come to a 0.79 okay, as my sum. First, how many people can corroborate that number? Okay, that's, that's working for us. Now that actually is our observed value of chi-square. I can turn the lights on just for a moment. We'll come back to the computer in a second. But I wanted to put this into context pictorially. Here's the distribution of all possible chi-square values that we might have. And this is probability, where that's a high probability, that's a low probability. The range of possible chi-square values extends from zero okay, all the way up to positive infinity. And we have to get past some critical value for us to say that we're in the rejection region, where we would reject the null hypothesis that in the population, attitudes toward AA are independent of political party. Okay? If we're here, we can reject. If we're not here, we can't reject. We would have to retain the null hypothesis. Who's following that? Okay, that's, that's the logic that we have. So we are at 0.79. That doesn't look like a very high number. It doesn't seem like we're too far out that way. But we actually have to get the critical value to make that determination. To get the critical value, we need to determine the degrees of freedom. So on our sheet, can somebody help me in computing the degrees of freedom for this particular problem? What would I do? Degrees of freedom. Thanks, Mira. Yes, right, the number, number of items that we have in the rows, minus 1, times the column, minus 1. So that's going to be something like this. Degrees of freedom in this case is how many rows do I have? Yell it out. In this 2 by 2, how many rows do I have? 2? Okay, so it's 2 minus 1 times 2 minus 1. Okay? And I'm going to do that by formula over here, and I'm actually going to type it in with an equal sign. And I'm going to literally put in 2 minus 1 times 2 minus 1. On the test, you are invited but not required to be that literal about things. Most of you can do that in your head, and you know that this is going to come out to one degree of freedom. I'm going to put that here, spelling it all out, just so you know how that formula in Excel ties back to the formula that you have on the sheet. 
Who's seeing that correspondence? Does that work? And how many people derived one degree of freedom here? <laughs> Okay, so now what we have to do is find out what the critical value is for chi-square, and we could look at that handout that we had, or that, uh, the item that we had showed you the other day, where we have the critical values listed by alpha level and degrees of freedom. And let's get the critical value here. We can do this inside of Excel. We actually don't have to look at the sheet. Okay. And the critical value for one degree of freedom will be derived from this chi-inv function. So if you put in equals chi inv and just to make sure we're all on board what other kind of inverse function did we have before before we did chi squares we had some other kind of inverse function inside of excel what was that yell out if you remember it we did equals something inv equals something dist what was it yeah, there was a dist and there was an inv what were those things there was a norms inv a norms dist who remembers that Norms in, norms dist, okay. So you'll have to be using those on Wednesday. Here we're not dealing with a normal curve. We're dealing with the chi-square, which is positively skewed. So we'll put in equals chi in. What's our favorite probability around here? The uh, criterion alpha level for most sciences? 0.05, right? So let's put in 0 0.05, okay. How many degrees of freedom did we say we had a moment ago? One, okay. All right, so I'm going to put in equals chi in 0.05, comma 1, because I have one degree of freedom. I'm going to hit that button, and I'm going to get 3.84. And what that tells me is that here's the zero chi-square, here's infinity, here's 3.84, and that's my cutoff point, 3.84. If I'm greater than that, I can be in the rejection region. If I'm less than 3.84, I'm not in the rejection region. I would have to retain the null hypothesis in that case. Who's following that logic? Okay. All right, so what do you think? Are we going to retain or reject in this case? Let's take a look at what we just computed for chi-square, how big it would have to be for us to reject. Retain or reject? Okay. How many people would like to retain? We'll do that by a show of hands. How many people would like to reject? How many people are not sure what's going on here? Okay, thank you for being honest. <laughs> so what has to happen, it's kind of like we're doing a high jump. We have to high jump over some value. In this case, we have to high jump over 3.84. If we get 3.84 or higher, we made it into the rejection region. If we don't get 3.84, we're down here somewhere. We're not in the rejection region. We'd wind up retaining them. Does that help? Yeah? Okay, very good. All right, so let's go ahead and start to write our APA-style decision. In our videos, uh, we talk about the American Psychological Association's style for writing these kinds of conclusions, and we might say something like this. We retain HO, that's the null hypothesis, we retain HO because the obtained value of chi-square, and we might just put that in parentheses, 0 0.79, is less than the critical value. And the critical value, again, was roughly 3.84. If we were lawyers, right, we'd have to have some evidence to make our case. We'd have to have evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Here, the evidence that we have to offer is a chi-square based evidence. And that evidence has to be of a certain magnitude, a certain strength. How strong? 3.84 in this particular case. Okay. How do we do on the evidence? Well, we're down here at like 0 0.79. We're down here-ish. So we're really nowhere near the rejection region. So we actually don't have any reason to believe that there is some kind of dependence between party and attitude uh, toward affirmative action, at least in this sample. OK? OK, a couple of questions. We'll go with Katie first and then with Rachel. So you decide if you're going to retain or um, Reject? Yeah, reject, sorry. Okay. Re the, um, That's right. That's right. So what happens is we always are going to compare two chi-square values. There's the one that we empirically observed, and you and I just went through all the computations and we came to a 0.79. That's our empirically observed. And then there's what the jury demands. What the jury demands is a certain level of evidence to have uh, confidence beyond a reasonable doubt, to use that language. And in this particular case, that was 3.84. Why? Well, because when we did the chi-inv back over here, the chi-inv told us how big that had to be, assuming that we had one degree of freedom, and we had a 0.05 alpha level, okay? So if it's less, you're going to retain it? If it's less, you're going to retain it, right? Okay, and we'll be clear about that if our chi-square value is less, okay. okay? Okay, Rachel also had a question. Um, I'm just so a little confused about the degrees of freedom. Good. 
good. You're confused about the degrees of freedom. It's good to be confused about that because we haven't said a whole lot about what those actually mean. Uh, are you looking for a conceptual understanding of degrees of freedom? Good. Excellent, excellent. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit about that now and then more about that. Degrees of freedom is actually a fairly difficult concept. But I wonder, given Rachel's excellent question, if I can offer you this. The chi-square distribution always has this positive skew. Okay? It always has the positive skew. It actually turns out that there isn't one chi-square distribution, there is a family of chi-square distributions. And they differ ever so slightly from each other based on the degrees of freedom. This might be the chi-square distribution for df equals 1, but if we had a uh, chi-square distribution for df equals 2, this number will change slightly. If it's df equals 3, that number will change slightly again. So this boundary is going to rise or fall depending on how many degrees of freedom that we have. The degrees of freedom conceptually ties back to how complicated a matrix do we have. Here we have a 2 by 2. Okay? If we had a 2 by 3, then we'd go through that computation and we'd wind up with some number like maybe degrees of freedom 2, and that's going to alter this a little bit. Okay? okay, does that help us? So it's a really good question because we're taking on faith where this number comes from. It comes from some kind of a chart, it comes from an Excel command, but hopefully this gives you some idea about uh, where that number is originating from. It's going to be some point along this x-axis that's going to depend on how tightly bent this curve is, and that all depends on the degrees of freedom, which speaks to how complicated our matrix is. 2 by 3, 2 by 2, 17 by 48, a 17 by 48 is a pretty complicated matrix, <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. Other questions or comments on that? Okay, I'm going to take a chance here. Normally, I would draw the line there and say we've done some hypothesis testing. We've compared our observed value of chi-square to the critical value. And as Katie's pointed out, whenever we exceed that, we can reject. When we're uh, lower than that, we have to retain. We're going to do the same kind of reasoning but now we're going to speak not in terms of the chi-square statistic, but we're going to speak in terms of the observed alpha level. Our criterion alpha level we just pumped in a moment ago. What was that? The probability that we pumped in? 0.05, and that's going to be our criterion alpha level throughout the entire semester. And that's really true for almost all sciences. The very commonly used criterion, and that's going to be the 0.05 alpha level. That means that you've got a 5% chance of making an error. What we're going to do is a very similar kind of analysis. I'll ask you to join me by going back up to here, where it says critical value. Okay? We'll come down underneath that, or if you don't have space underneath, you might go above. Or We'll obtain the observed value called the observed alpha level. So there are actually two alpha levels. There's the criterion alpha level, 0.05, that never changes. Okay? What we want to know, though, is what alpha level is associated with the observed value? Our observed value is like 0.79. And the alpha level, let's just make sure we're all okay with that. What did alpha correspond to from our earlier conversations? The alpha level 0.05, what does that actually reflect? Talked about hypothesis testing. Any notions about what the alpha level reflects? That's the probability of making a type 1 error. Right? So we have type 1 errors and type 2 errors and all that. So this is the probability of a type 1 error. And we want to know what that probability is. So now what we're going to do is say equals, we'll do chi dist, okay? And at this time, we put in the observed value of chi square, and our observed value is, you yell it out? I think I hear 0.79, we'll click on that. Okay, that's the 0.79 is the observed value, okay? And how many degrees of freedom did we say we had? One, One okay. All right. And now we come up to this number, I'll put that in a different color still. Okay. 0.379. First, how many people get that number? Okay. So what would normally have to happen is we'd have to have a really big chi-square, and that would put us way, way out here. Okay. And we'd also say that we'd want to have a sig value in SPSS that's lower than 0.05. Who remembers doing that? Sig value in SPSS lower than 0.05 was our cutoff for statistical significance. So this number has to be lower than 0.05, but it isn't. It's at 0.37. If it were lower than 0.05, we could reject the null hypothesis. Here, it's a 0.37, we have to retain the null hypothesis. Yeah. Who's following that? Right. Okay? All right, tell me about your confusion. Okay, so if it's less than 0.05, don't what you do? What do we do if something's less than, if the sig value is less than 0.05? Okay, if it's less than 0.05, if the sig value if it's less than 0.05, we reject. 
Okay? So this is where we spend a little bit of time because there are two ways to play this game. Okay? Here's the cutoff point. Right? If our chi-square is bigger than 3.84, we reject. Who's okay with that? All right? How much space under this curve is to the right of this? Anybody want to help me with that? Here's a cutoff point. How much space is up here? How much space is down here? What percentage is up here? What percentage is down here? Any idea what the 0.05 means? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Five. There you go. 5% chance. I don't know. 5% chance that it's an error. Like okay, right. 5% chance that, that we're rejecting this in error. We can get really big chi-squares here by chance 5% of the time. This is 5% that way and 95% that way. Why don't I fill that in? Okay. Here's 5%. And I'll call that actually 0.05 if that helps us. 0.05 is that way. Okay, and 95% is that way. Who's all right with that? Does that work for us? Okay. So we only reject if we have a very, very unusual kind of chi-square, one that's really, really high. One that's really, really high would be greater than 3.84. Who's okay with that? Okay. And a chi-square that's greater than 3.84 would happen something like 5% of the time or less. Who's following that? Okay. That's where that number is coming from. So we have two different ways to play this game. We can go by the chi-square. We'd have to beat 3.84. We'd have to be bigger than 3.84. Or we can ask about this idea of the observed alpha level, and that would have to be less than 0.05. That's a way of expressing this in terms of percentages. And it would have to be the most extreme 5% or even further out than that. Okay? Please go ahead. Um, can you just repeat the formula for finding the observed alpha level? Yep. Okay. So the observed alpha level. These are chi inv and chi dist. So the critical value is chi inv, and there's chi dist. Okay? A couple of other questions. Please go ahead. in terms of the chi-square. That is a beautiful statement. They always have to come to exactly the same conclusion. It could not mathematically be otherwise. As I'm going further and further out here, my chi-square is getting bigger, and the area to the right of any particular line I might draw is getting smaller and smaller. I, I, it's a different way to say the same thing. And so today we're grappling with how do we have two different languages for the same for the exact same idea. We're trying to find an unusual score. We can define that by saying we have a really big chi-square or that we have a really big percentage. Now, one other idea. A gentleman who is six foot ten, pretty tall guy, not so tall. What do you think? Tall. Pretty tall guy, okay. Where would he be in the percentile ranks? Remember we talked about percentile ranks? But, I mean roughly. I mean it's, you don't have to come up with the exact number. Yeah, some idea. Okay, so he's going to be at maybe like, he's probably even taller than the 95th percentile. Like maybe we'd be in the 99th percentile. So 99% of people would be shorter than him, and maybe only 1% would be taller than him. Who's okay with that? Does that work for us? Okay, so we can talk about how tall this guy is in percentile ranks, right? He's in the 99th percentile. Only 1% is bigger than he is. Or we can say he's 6 foot 10, okay? That would be another way of expressing the same thing. We could also give him a Z score in height. Right, that would be a third way of expressing the same thing. But we're always talking about maybe the same point on the distribution, even though we have these very different terminologies for it. And part of the challenge in this course is just getting our brains around using different words for really the same concept, sometimes expressed as a percentage, sometimes expressed as what we might call a raw score, in inches and feet, six foot ten, or in chi-squares. Okay? Who's following that? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, right. So if, if somehow you had a really big chi-square and you wound up with a, also a really big one of these, you, you must have put in some kind of finger error or something like that. Yep. Okay. Okay. We'll do some more of these as time goes on. This is a difficult concept, uh, trying to understand that there are two different ways of saying this. And this is why we try to prime the pump with doing raw scores and z-scores and percentile ranks. But Jen has got the, the right idea that there are two different ways of saying the same thing. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and save this one and in a few minutes, we'll come back and do uh, some more tests that are chi-square related. Okay? In fact, maybe you can help me out. Let's see if we can begin to bridge to the next topic. We just did the chi-square test of independence. Can somebody remind us of the other variety of chi-square test? It actually comes in two flavors, chi-square. Goodness of fit, I think I hear it from a couple of folks. So the goodness of fit. Can anybody tell us how they're different from each other? 
Uh, why, how is a chi-square test of goodness of fit different from a chi-square test of independence? I'll give you that they are both looking for qualitative variables, or they both analyze qualitative variables, these categorical or nominal variables. Any notion about how they differ from each other? Okay, thanks, Sasha. Okay. 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 Goodness of fit is a really good start. The, the chi-square test of independence is about the association between two variables, right? Uh, one qualitative variable and another qualitative variable. The chi-square test for the, uh, that was independence, the chi-square test for the goodness of fit has only one variable. Okay, there aren't two variables, there's only one. And if we're trying to make some statistical analysis on a single variable, regardless of how many levels it might have, then we would use the chi-square test for the goodness of fit. So if you only have the one variable, it's goodness of fit. If you have two or more, then it's chi-square test of independence. Who's following that? Okay. What you'll see is that these are, again, chi-squares. We're still going to use chi-inv. We're still going to use chi-dist. We're still going to use this. We're still going to be able to talk about this in terms of feet and inches, which is to say chi-squares, and also percentages. None of that changes. This is actually the simpler case that we have, where we're just going to be classifying our data based on one dimension rather than two dimensions. So I'll go back here just to motivate this a little bit. Well, Remind you of what you saw in the video. Okay, here is the chi-square test of goodness of fit. And we might think about it this way. In about three weeks or so, you will meet with your advisors to talk about the courses that you might take next semester. And we're always very interested, the faculty are very interested, what drives students' course preferences? And there are lots of possibilities here. One is time of day. One is who the instructor is. One is the extent to which you have an intrinsic interest in the course. Another one is, I'm always impressed when students tell me this, how easy is the course? Sometimes they just tell me they want a really easy course for next semester. Maybe because they have other hard courses or something like that. So what we can ask is maybe by way of survey, of those four possibilities, which do you think drives your choice for courses most? And I don't need you to answer now, but you can imagine that we would have surveyed you know, maybe 80 people or so, and we would have gotten responses that are qualitatively different from one another. Um, time of day is qualitatively different from the instructor, which is qualitatively different from intrinsic interest, which is qualitatively different from ease. So who's following the problem so far? Okay. Now what we might ask is, are these, for example, equally likely to occur in the population? And if we did have a sample of 80, okay, then our expected value, if we had an even Steven hypothesis, as I call it in the video, is to divide the number of observations by the number of categories. So that would mean that we'd expect something like 20 if all of these are equally likely to occur. Okay? Because we're simply dividing by the number of categories. In this case, it's four categories. So our expected values would be 80 divided by 40 it would equal 20 in each of those four categories. Who's following that? Anybody lost by that? Okay. So in a way, this is actually the easier one. And now we can say that we have an expected value for each of these different categories. And then we might take a look at uh, an empirical observation. And we might say that we asked 80 Denisonians what they thought was their leading reason for selecting courses. 30 of them said time of day was most important. 10 said instructor. 22 said their intrinsic interest in the course. And 18 said the ease. Okay. Was that a question, Mira, or just a stretch? Okay. All right, real good. So we actually have down the observed values and we have the expected values. What was the expected value for each of these categories, real loud? 20, okay. And we can do observed minus expected. We can get that quantity squared, just like we did a moment ago. And we could sum those guys up. Uh, and we can figure out how big does our chi-square get? Does our chi-square get to be 6 foot 10? Or is it something shorter than 6 foot 10, essentially? Right? And then we can figure out whether we want to retain or reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis might be something like, in the population, um, the four different reasons for selecting a course are equally likely to occur. Okay? And we can test for equality here. By the way, I use this, I, I called it the even-steven hypothesis a moment ago. That wouldn't have to be your model. You might have some other model where you say, for example, that maybe 70% of the students are going to go with time of day and the others are 10% each. If that were your model, um, that's easy enough to test also. We could derive the expected values and compare them, as always, to the observed values. So the recurring theme, as you might see in chi-square, is observed minus expected quantity squared. We sum those up and we see where we land, a relatively probable or relatively improbable place on the chi-square distribution. Okay. All right, who's following that? Yep, okay, why don't we do one?
Okay? So here's our formula, same kind of formula that we had a moment ago. That's the frequency of uh, expect observed and the frequency of expected. That difference gets squared. We normalize it by the expected value. And now we're summing over only the one row that we have because we don't have columns. We only have rows because we have just one variable. Okay. All right. So would you please join me in going out to the S drive? We can put the other one away. And we can go into our practice problems. We'll go into the chi-square problems. And now we're doing the goodness of fit. And there's something there that says chi-square good fit practice set. Okay. And just to remind you that as we're coming up on the quiz in a couple of days, you can always come in here, or I think you can even do this from uh, your, your home computers or your laptop computers. If you want to dial in, you have all of those practice sets that are color-coded. Right? So you can always see how these computations are working. So let's see if we can go ahead and click on chi-square good fit. Okay. Show of hands, how many people have that? Able to get that? Okay, why don't I turn the lights down one more time? I'll make this a little bit bolder too, so you can see it a little bit more easily. And as you can see up top, it says that we want to know if the four reasons for selecting, course, or selecting a course, and there they are, time of day, instructor, interest, and ease, are equally likely to influence course selection. And we're going to test this at the 0.05 alpha level, which means that we're going to try to figure out where we fall on this distribution, upper 5% or lower 95%. Reject or retain the null hypothesis. Okay? All right, why don't we begin by putting in an HO, and you tell me how we get this started. What's our favorite prepositional phrase? In the population. Wow, this group showed up to play. Okay, in the population. Okay? And we might say something like the four reasons for selecting courses are equally likely. It wouldn't have to be that way, but we're going to go with this even Steven hypothesis, which means that we, we don't have a, a reason to prefer one of these over the next before we obtain our data, so we'll just say that they're equally likely. Right? Okay? And we have these empirical observations. Um, the next thing we want to do is change this into the alternate hypothesis. I'll make a control C. I'll come down here to control V. Okay? And we'll say that we need to change this. You tell me, how do I change this into an alternate hypothesis? What's the first thing I'll do with my HO? Make it a 1, okay? That becomes an H1, okay? Okay, and how do I change the wording in that to turn it into an alternate hypothesis? Not, okay? So in the population, the four reasons for selecting courses are not equally likely to occur. We haven't specified the direction there. We just said that they're not equally likely. Okay? We have the observed values. We need to get the expected values. Okay? Can somebody just remind us of the logic for getting the expected values? Maybe you have it computationally, maybe you don't have it computationally, but what's the logic there? Thanks, Skip. Yeah. Okay, there should each be 20. Just to remind you about that, that was exactly right. If we can go over here and we can put something like, uh, what would this be, a row marginal? If you don't want to call it that, you just want to call it a total, that's fine. But this is equal to the sum of all of these items. And that turned out to be 80. And as Kip correctly noted, because they're all equally likely, and there are 40 of them, I'll be very formal here. I'll say that equals our total divided by the four categories. If you just want to put in a 20 there, that's fine. Um, but we would need to be able to come to 20 through one mechanism or the other. So I now have my observed values and I have my expected values. And chi-square is always a comparison between those two. So the null hypothesis is telling us that the expected values are what they are. In this case, they're 20. Okay? Now we have to do that little computation that you saw a moment ago. It looked kind of like this. And I think you've got that maybe on today's handout or maybe that's the back of the other day's handout. That's the observed minus expected quantity squared divided by the expected. Okay. So same computation that we did earlier today. Let's put that together. That again is O minus E. The expected values are all 20? Yeah, how did we get that? Yeah, how did we get that? So there are 80 in total. Let me pause there. Is that working for you? Yeah. Okay. And we have four categories. Does that work? Okay. If we had two categories, can you tell me what the numbers would have been? If we had 80 and we had two categories, 
then, then they would be 40 each. Okay? So that, that's the logic there. Okay? So this is observed minus expected quantity squared. We'll just put the formula in to remind us. And then that entire squared component gets normalized by the expected value. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Equals, here I'll put it in as 30 minus, I'll click on the 20. That quantity gets squared. Okay? And then that whole squared deviate gets normalized by 20. Okay? And I wound up with a 5. I'm going to make these a little bit darker in some way. Maybe I'll make them a dark green. Maybe I can make them a little bit bigger too. Okay, and I came up with an, a, a squared deviate of 5. Who's, who can corroborate that number? Okay. Does that work for us? And it might even be that we can take advantage of the spatial relationships that we have there uh, and just keep on moving that on over. So I'm going to do control C and I'll do that. Okay, and we'll get rid of all of that. We'll make this a bigger row marginal. And I'm getting these deviates of 5, 5, 0.2, and 0.2. Who can corroborate those numbers? Okay, and we'll put, take a pause because some folks are catching up with us. Anybody not quite there, not quite at 5, 5, 0.2, and 0.2? Certainly, okay. So here it is. It's observed minus expected, so it's going to be parenthetically 30 minus 20. We'll square that difference, and then we'll divide by the expected value. And that formula, again, is, is here. In case that helps. It's essentially the same formula as on the other side, but, but there it is. It's a little bit simpler on this side. Okay. All right, now we need to get the chi-square, and as this summation sign suggests, we need to sum over the different cells in our display. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we'll say, and here we've got the chi-square. And we're going to simply sum over all of these square deviates that we have. Equals the sum. Okay, and I came to a 10.4. I'll make that big and bold so the people in the back can see. And I'll see by show of hands who can corroborate that number, 10.4. Okay, we're not quite there yet, but remember that we could have a chi-square that was zero. We could go all the way up to positive infinity. Um, we need to get past some critical point, and we'll figure out what that critical point is right now. To do that, we need the degrees of freedom. Okay, and what is the degrees of freedom computation according to this sheet? Let's all yell it out. Degrees of freedom equals... C minus 1, and C stands for what? The number of columns. How many columns do we have? Ding, 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 ding. Four columns, okay? We had four different categories. So this will be equal to 4 minus 1, and I'll do that over here. Equals 4 minus 1, or 3 degrees of freedom. And I'll put that in green and bold, and see by a show of hands how many people followed that see where the degrees of freedom comes from, okay? And as I think it was Rachel asked a moment ago, the chi-square distribution always looks like this, but they're actually a family of chi-squares, and they bend a little bit differently depending on how many degrees of freedom we, we have. In this particular case, we have three degrees of freedom, so our number might be similar to 3.84, but it won't be exactly the same. Let's go ahead and get the critical value, okay? and we'll say equals, you tell me, what was the chi formula here? Chi inv to get the critical value. What's our favorite probability? All semester long, it's going to be 0.05. How many degrees of freedom did we say we had? Three, okay. And so now what happens is instead of this being 3.84, I'm going to turn the lights up for a moment, we have a new value to beat. And that number that we have to beat is 7.81-ish. Okay. So this guy comes off. Same kind of a picture, but now we have three degrees of freedom. And the new number to beat is now 7.81 and some change. I'll leave it at 7.81. Okay? 5% of the distribution is higher than 7.81. 95% of the distribution is lower than 7.81. Who's following that? Okay? All right. Now, we can ask whether we exceeded the value. 10.4, does that exceed 7.814? So it does. So that means that we've got a really unusual score, and we can actually reject the null hypothesis in this case. Who's following that? Okay. So, uh, and just to see if we can bring it all home in our last moment, why don't we see if we can do exactly the same thing, but now instead of asking just how big is this in terms of chi-square, which is how many feet and inches, we can talk about something like percentile ranks, uh, what percentage of this distribution are we talking about here. So let's go ahead and use that other bit. We'll call this the, uh, the observed alpha level. 
The criterion alpha level is always 0.5. The observed alpha level, I'll make that real big, we relied on a different kind of chi command. What was that other chi command called? Equal chi, dist. And now what we get prompted for is the actual chi-square value. We got a chi-square of 10.4. We'll put that one in. That's kind of like putting in our 6 foot 10 inches or 6 foot 9 inches from the guy that we were talking about before. 3 degrees of freedom. Okay. And now this tells us that only 1.5% of this entire distribution is to the right of this guy. So we're way out here somewhere. Okay? We needed to be in the 95th percentile or higher, and we're now out at something like 100 minus 1.5, or maybe something like the 98.5 percentile. Only 1.5 is higher that way. Who's following that? That work for us? Okay. So we can end, and we're at 220, by saying that we're simply going to reject the null hypothesis here, um, that these are equally likely to occur. Okay. All right. That was a lot of computation. I'm going to save that for us. When we come back tomorrow, we'll talk about other kinds of tests that we might be running, including the t-test. But the t-test will have a similar kind of logic to this. Okay. All right, so please watch the video for tonight. And please read in your uh, manual uh, how you would do the t-test inside of uh, SPSS. And we'll do those things in class tomorrow. Have a great day. Um, are these on Blackboard? How do we like, get them on our computers? Right, so what you can do is you can email them to yourselves, oh. or, uh, or you can, some people can get into the S drive from their computer, and some people can't, okay? Yes, please take advantage of all of these, all these practice problems. Please do the readings, please do the videos, otherwise this stuff is very difficult. Take advantage of the videos. I think so, yeah, I think to, uh, I think I'll have a few openings tomorrow. Would you send me an email about times that work for you? Could you come in at 9.30 or would that not work for you? I have class at 10. You have class at 10. Okay. Uh, will we need more than a half hour or? Probably not. Okay. Okay. So if you came in at 9.30 sharp, we'll try to do as far as we, go as far as we can. Okay. Great. Thanks, Nina. They're, it's up to you, it's wide open.